Police say that this man killed a woman and posted a video of her dying online. On the 26th of July, police in Nevada received a report of a disturbing video on Facebook. Police were actually able to locate the telephone number of the person who posted the video due to the seriousness of the crime. They tracked the number to a apartment complex in San Mateo. As police did not have a specific address to go to, they had to go door to door around the whole apartment complex. After three hours, they were able to locate a deceased person in one of the apartments. They identified the suspect as Mark Murchikoff and they arrested him. The video that was posted on Facebook allegedly shows Mark stabbing the victim. He callously filmed the victim's last moments of life. Police say that the motive is still unknown. Mark is currently charged with murder. A teenager who killed her dad with drain cleaner has been released. Megan Imerowitz from Michigan was sentenced to one year in prison and five years probation this week. However, because she has already spent 506 days in prison, she's actually already been released. She killed her dad, 64 year old Conrad in 2021. During the trial, prosecutors stated that her dad, Conrad, had refused to take Megan to a hair salon. It was October 2021 and Megan apparently wanted a lift, but he'd been drinking and was unable to take her. Megan, who was 18 at the time, threw chemical drain cleaner on her dad while he slept. He was then hospitalized for severe chemical burns all over his body. He was actually placed on life support. He did survive for five months, but did pass away on March the 6th, 2022. During the trial, Megan told the judge, the prosecution has tried to make me look like a monster, but that's not me and never was. What this girl did to herself will make you feel physically sick. This is one of the most shocking cases of psychosis I've ever heard. On February the 6th, 2018, Kaylee Muffart was using substances. She was high on M after a 48 hour binge. She ended up stumbling down the road next to a railway track. In her substance induced state, she believed that she needed to save the world. And in order to do so, she needed to make a sacrifice. Horrifically, she believed that she needed to scrape her eyeballs out of her head or everybody would die. So that's exactly what she did. With her bare hands, she removed her own eyeballs. She then squashed them into her hands while a passerby struggled to restrain her. She was airlifted to hospital in South Carolina. She is now obviously completely blind, but thankfully is sober. She's a mother to a toddler and she wants to help people through them hearing her story. A man attacked me and devoured my face while under the influence of zombie drugs. In May 2012 in Miami, a man named Rudy Eugene first approached me in a friendly manner, but without warning, he metamorphosed into a real monster. He gave me a brutal wrestling hold, tried to strangle me before unleashing a ferocious attack, ripping my face off with his teeth. The nightmarish scene lasted 18 long minutes, during which I fought for my survival. My ordeal ended when the police intervened and shot Rudy Eugene. Toxicological tests revealed that he had consumed a high dose of drugs, after numerous operations, I lost my sight, my nose, and 75% of my face. The pain I endured is indescribable, but my determination to survive remains unshakable, despite the profound physical after-effects. My name is Ronald Popo, and I'm a survivor of the monster attack that changed my life forever. Do you think the death of the man who destroyed my life is punishment enough? I killed my prison cellmate because he was a rape and I despise that. My name is Steven Sanderson, and I am 51 years old. I was imprisoned in 1991 for murder. While in prison, I had a new cellmate named Theodore Dyer, who was 67 years old and had been sentenced to 25 years in prison for sexual crimes involving several minors. One evening, he wouldn't stop confessing everything he had done and kept trying to justify his conviction for child sexual assault. I had repeatedly asked him to stop talking to me about it because what he was telling me drove me mad with rage. Despite this, he continued all evening to justify acts that are, in my opinion, unjustifiable. That's why, when he continued to confess after I had asked him to stop, I hit him in the face several times and then he fell. That's when I strangled him with a cord that was in our cell and he died instantly. That day, I decided to take justice into my own hands.
and it was a real relief for me because I thought his sentence was not long enough. I killed and drank the blood of my six victims, including my own son, because I believed my blood was turning to powder, and I had to drink theirs to prevent this from happening. I am Richard Chase, known as the Vampire of Sacramento. From a young age, I was haunted by terrifying thoughts stemming from my paranoid schizophrenia, which drove me to commit the unimaginable. I started by killing animals, drinking their blood in the belief that it would keep my blood liquid. But unfortunately, one day, animal blood was no longer enough for me, and that's why I killed my first human, Ambrose Griffin, on December 29, 1977. I then continued with a pregnant woman, and then with Evelyn Mirath, my own six-year-old son, my 22-month-old nephew, and a family friend. I drank their blood, dismembered their bodies, seeking a cure for my inner torment. But in the end, my quest for healing was just an illusion of my sick mind, a path that led to my own destruction. The police found my apartment covered in blood. In 1979, I was convicted on six counts of first-degree murder and sentenced to death. However, in 1980, I took my own life by overdosing on prescribed medication. There has been a breakthrough in the cold case killing of a 12-year-old girl. In 1993, 12-year-old Jennifer Odom was about to walk home. She was last seen getting off the school bus in Pasco County. Tragically, she never made it home that day. Six days later, police made a hideous discovery. Her body was found along a horse riding trail in Hernando County. Her body showed signs that she had been brutally attacked and murdered. Originally, there was a hunt for a driver of a blue pickup truck who had been seen in the area by eyewitnesses. Unfortunately, her case has remained cold for all of these years up until now. A breakthrough has come in this case in the form of biological material collected from another crime. Months prior to Jennifer's death, another local teen in the area was attacked and SA'd. Through DNA analysis, 61-year-old Jeffrey Crum has been identified as the prime suspect. Police have worked for years gathering evidence against the suspect. Interestingly, he did own a blue pickup truck and was local to the area at the time that Jennifer was abducted. The state attorney has said the following. I have confidence that we have the right person and that we have the right aggravators in this particular case to treat it as a death penalty case. Jeffrey has been charged with murder, kidnapping and S battery. A man who worked at Lidl was caught planning a mass UK shooting. Reed Wisherson is a 32 year old man from Somerset. To the customers that he saw daily, he seemed like any other shop worker. Little did they know he was planning something horrendous. Secretly, he had been planning a UK mass shooting. He had been collecting explosives, weapons and ammunition. He'd also chillingly written a list of people that he wanted to target and kill for revenge. On his list, he had some teachers from the school that he used to attend. He also had plans to attack police headquarters. Now, luckily, locals got wind of his weapons and decided to tip off the police. They were then obviously able to intercept and show up at his house in November 2022. Officers searched the property that he shared with his dad and found multiple weapons. During the search, Reed rushed to the bathroom and attempted to take his life with one of the firearms. He then terrifyingly tried to turn the gun on police and when he failed to drop the weapon, they shot him multiple times. He was then rushed to hospital and was eventually interviewed by police when he was discharged. He tried to claim that the kill list was just a fantasy he wrote for a joke. However, it came out later in court that he had a fascination with mass killings, including Dunblane and Columbine. He was found guilty of weapons, ammunition and explosive charges. It doesn't bear thinking about what could have potentially happened if police hadn't received that tip. He's currently awaiting sentencing. This is flaying, one of the worst forms of punishment explained. Flaying truly is one of the worst ancient methods of torture and execution, and many cartel organizations still use it to this day. So let me tell you what it would be like to be skinned alive. First of all, you're in for a bit of a process. Human skin just doesn't slide off your body. You would need to be tenderized a little bit. Either you will be placed in the sun all day until you're burnt to a crisp, or dipped into boiling water. Which one would you prefer? But, sadly, that's not even the worst part. Instead of having time to recover from your smoldering pain, the flaying process will begin. The skin on your face will be sliced off first, because it's the easiest and the most accessible. The cut will extend beneath all layers of skin just above the muscle. 
After, small punctures will be made all over your body to score the flesh. Then, very long, thin pieces will be cut and peeled off of you, like you're just some kind of fruit. You will feel every single nerve ending as it is dissected, and these nerves extend into even your deepest layer of skin. This horrific torture will go on for hours. Death will come from blood loss, shock, hyperthermia, or infection. Your skin is an organ that keeps in heat and keeps out dangerous bacteria, and without it, you cannot survive. You would then be forced to enjoy your agony up to an entire day before your system gives out. This is just awful, and can you actually imagine this happening to you? This man murdered his wife and tried to blame it on Netflix. Amadou Karoma was 48 years old living in Brixton. He worked as a delivery driver and lived with his wife. She was 46-year-old Miriam who worked as a community nurse. The pair had a 19-year-old son together called Ishmael. It was January 2022 and soon things would change irreversibly for the family. Those close to the couple knew that things were toxic between them. Mariam had actually shockingly shared with her friends that she feared that her husband would kill her. Amadou was very suspicious of his wife and feared that she would leave him for another man. In the early hours of the 24th of January, he stabbed his wife with a kitchen knife as she slept. She had stab wounds to her face, neck and chest. He then used petrol to set fire to the crime scene. The fire service raced to the property as Amadou and his son escaped. They then discovered his wife's burnt body in the bedroom. Jerry cans of petrol were found in the loft and it was clear that somebody had recently been up there. Mariam's blood was found on the banisters of the house. Amadou suffered burns to his foot and police noticed that he smelt very strongly of petrol. When they quizzed him on what had happened, he actually tried to pin the murder on his teenage son. He blamed the fact that he had been recently watching the Netflix show, You. He said it must have inspired his son to do something horrific. Despite this, Amadou's story did not wash with police and he was found guilty of murder. He got a minimum term of 29 years with a concurrent sentence for seven years for arson. Did you know that Utah is one of the few states that still allow execution by firing squad and the last person to die by firing squad was this man in 2010? This is Ronnie Lee Gardner. In October of 1984, he killed 37-year-old Melvin Otterstrom during a robbery in Salt Lake City by shooting him in the face. He then went to his funeral and pretended that he was a childhood friend. It would then take three weeks for Ronnie to be located and arrested. While being moved for a court hearing in April of 1985, Ronnie would try to escape the Utah State Prison using a smuggled revolver. During the attempt, he killed a 36-year-old attorney named Michael Burdell by shooting him in the eye. Ronnie spent most of his childhood and adult life in jail and even successfully escaped the Utah State Prison once before the murders. Ronnie was convicted of two counts of murder. For the first count, he was sentenced to life in prison, but for the murder of Michael, he was given the death penalty. Ronnie was given the option to either be executed by firing squad or lethal injection, but he chose the firing squad because of his Mormon background and the old doctrine of blood atonement. His last meal was steak, lobster tail, apple pie, vanilla ice cream, and 7-Up. He also spent his final moments watching the Lord of the Rings trilogy. On June 18th, 2010, he was then restrained to a metal chair and had a hood placed over his head at the Utah State Prison in Draper. Five volunteer police officers lined up and stood about 25 feet away from him while aiming at a white target covering his heart. They then counted down from five, and right before two, they started firing. Ronnie was dead within two minutes. This case gained massive media attention because Ronnie was the first person to die by firing squad in the U.S. in 14 years. The disappearance of Brian Schaefer, and it still has not been the solved. Salt, no. On March 31st, 2006, his roommate Clint had invited him out that same night to go out for drinks and stuff to celebrate the end of classes. And they go to this bar named the Ugly Tuna Saluna. When they get there, him and Clint decide to go bar hopping for the rest of the night. They meet up with one of Clint's friends named Meredith, and all three of them go bar hopping until they decide to go back for some final shots at the Ugly Tuna Bar. There's surveillance footage of them going inside the bar. And and then an hour later, he comes out the bar, but you see him talking to two other girls in the video or whatever. But within those time frames of him stepping out and him being separated from His Clint friends. and Meredith, they never see each other again. Once the night ends, Clint and Meredith came to the conclusion that he probably went home by himself. Because he did live a couple blocks away from the bar and stuff. They didn't think anything of it until the next morning, the next day, when his girlfriend is calling him constantly throughout the day, but he's not answering. He tells his dad to go check up at his apartment. His dad goes, he sees his car still there, his room is untouched no sign of anybody being home that's when his dad calls the police they 
do a massive search for him and they couldn't find him they go to the bar to look at the footage they see him going back inside never coming out never coming day. out I have no emergency exit nothing they even looked around other buildings surrounding the bar and not a single camera ever captured him leaving the bar so it's kind of like he, he vanished from thin air what? show you prior to this people believe that he committed because yeah. that year his mom had passed away from cancer well, some people say that he basically left through a way where he wouldn't be detective just to start a new life and Nuevo Leon, Mexico, there's this paranormal phenomenon. Whenever you, you're driving on this short road and you come across this cross on the side of the road, if you turn your radio station to 690 AM, you'll hear a distorted ambulance noise in the background. They interviewed the people in the town as well yeah, and living next to that area. And they said that right there in that spot, a guy got shot, bro. A 26-year-old, they didn't say his name. They didn't even know who the he was. It was just some random guy that got shot. The reason why it went viral is because some guy on, on Facebook, he uploaded it because he heard that a lot of people in that time were telling him that this spot is haunted. So he ended up going. I got to see this video, bro. Por allá está la cruz. Everybody was saying that, oh, people were saying it was fake, it's just a hoax. So what he did, he went back, but this time he was on Facebook Live, and he also captured it again. Adios, muertito. So it was just a little bit more distorted and stuff, but this shit got so famous or whatever, and even Univision covered it as well, and... <laughs> People are kind of skeptical though They're like in between Because people are saying That it could also be An interruption In the frequency And like yeah. the The whole radio wave And shit like that But then other people are saying Nah bro it's Somebody died there And we know that they Welcome to Famous Autopsies Part 1 In this series I'll be breaking down Celebrity autopsy reports So this is a trigger warning I'm going to start with Actor Paul Walker Because his autopsy Is one of the worst I've ever came across Paul Walker was one of the stars in the Fast and Furious movie series. In 2013, he was leaving a charity event in Santa Clarita with his friend Roger. Roger was behind the wheel speeding at 95 miles per hour on a 45 mile an hour speed limit road. The car then crashed into a concrete lamp and smashed between two trees catching on fire. And Paul Walker and his friend Roger both ended up dying. Paul Walker was found with his right arm and hands extended up in the air as if he was pointing and he was likely pointing right before the accident occurred. But sometimes with extreme heat, it can cause the muscles to constrict and shrink, making it impossible to move. Paul Walker could not be visually identified. He didn't die on impact, and it was likely he was still breathing after the fire took place. An x-ray also revealed extreme fractures in his jaw, clavicle, arm, pelvis, ribs, and also his spine. He had charring all over his skin but on his feet, his buttocks, and his back because he was in a sitting position. Blood was also found in his lungs, bladder, scalp, and brain. His cause of death was listed as a combination of effects of traumatic and thermal injuries. And this whole ordeal was classified as an accident. Many people always wondered if Paul Walker suffered before he died, and I'm here to tell you he definitely did. This is just awful. Rest in peace to Paul Walker. Top 3 First Date Horror Stories That Ended in Criminal Charges 27-year-old Adam Hilaire met 18-year-old Haley Rose Bustos on the dating app Plenty of Fish in August of 2016. The two agreed to meet up. Hilaire took Bustos on a bowling date in Winter Haven, Florida. The couple spent time in Hilaire's house after the date, and all seemed well. They even agreed to meet up the next night. However, when Bustos returned to Hilaire's house, she brought three male criminals. The teen girl and her conspirators shot Hilaire and stole his valuable. The three were later arrested for the fatal crime. In September of 2014, 53-year-old Leon Shaw went on a first date with the woman in his Seattle town. The two drank heavily on their romantic romp, and the unnamed woman decided that she wanted a tattoo. To appease, Shaw took his date to a professional artist. The woman and the artist started to engage in intimacies, though, and Shaw grew angry. Allegedly, he slapped his date. In retaliation, the woman left the shop and stole Shaw's car. Shaw chased her, 
but she struck and killed him with the vehicle. After she ran him over and crashed the car, the woman was taken to a nearby hospital in critical condition. Virginia native Alan Richard Schmidt met a 23-year-old woman on the dating app Plenty of Fish. The pair decided to arrange their first date in October of 2017. The older man drove to meet his date, but the young lady was shocked to learn that her prospect was 77 years old. His age deterred her from carrying on a relationship. However, the woman did allow Schmidt to take her on a shopping spree. When Schmidt realized that his online love didn't reciprocate his feelings, he demanded that she return the $400 worth of clothing that he bought her. When the woman refused, Schmidt allegedly threw her to the ground and choked her. Schmidt was arrested on charges of felony strangling. These are the worst botched executions, and this one went completely wrong. This electric chair execution that I'm about to explain went disturbingly wrong in so many ways. And to make it worse, the prisoner was only 14 years old. In 1944, George Stinney was thrown on trial for the murder of two girls in South Carolina. The only circumstantial evidence was that he was the last one seen with the girls alive. They had reportedly asked him where they could find passion flowers. There is no denying that the color of his skin played a huge factor and it took an all-white jury less than 10 minutes to find him guilty. On June 16, 1944, George was ushered into his death chamber. The young boy only weighed 95 pounds, which was apparent by how baggy his stripped jumpsuit was. His legs were too thin for the electrodes to fit, and the electric chair looked giant in comparison and his feet didn't even touch the ground. Finally, the adult-sized mask was placed over his petite face, was clearly not going to stay put. And when asked if he had any last words, his voice quivered and cracked, and all he said was no sir. When the switch was flipped to begin the execution, his small body shook violently. This dislodged the mask, revealing his tear-drenched, pain-riddled face and wide blood-red eyes. He smoked and burned and writhed, filling the chamber with a pungent stench of cooking flesh. After the first round, George still wasn't dead. Another round was administered, causing his face to contort further. His eyes bulged and it almost looked as if he was sizzling. But he was still breathing. Finally, after the third round, George was pronounced dead. But the largest mishap of all wasn't revealed until decades later, when his guilty verdict was overturned. This is just insane to wrap your head around, and this literally happened less than 100 years ago. These are the 9-11 elevator deaths, one of the worst deaths imaginable explained. Thousands of people died on 9-11 in horrific ways. And this is just one of those ways. The Twin Towers stood just under 1,400 feet tall, and in 2001, they were considered the tallest building in the world. Inside the building was about 180 elevators, which consisted of 15 miles of elevator shafts. Each elevator was able to hold 52 people, and the motors used for the elevators were the biggest elevator motors in the world. This is one of those motors pictured here. And what I'm about to explain is one of the worst deaths people experienced on 9-11. At 8.46 a.m. on September 11, 2001, World Trade Center 1 was hit by the first plane. Obviously, at the time, elevators were being used, and they believe at the time the first plane hit, several people were inside of the elevators, and when the planes hit, the elevators stopped. People that were in the elevators during the initial impact probably died right away, depending on where the elevator was and where the plane struck. But they estimated that there was about 200 people inside the elevators at the time that did not die on the initial impact, but the elevators stopped working, and people were just stuck inside. And the most horrific aspect of this is that they had no way of escaping. Due to the damage that was already done, there was no way of opening the doors, there was no way of climbing through the top. So these people were just stuck in the elevators, sitting there, waiting to die. They had to sit in this small, compact elevator with who knows how many other people, and hear all the sounds of chaos around them, hear debris and the screams of other horrified people, and they probably had no idea that the building was going to collapse. But once that process began, I can't even imagine the fear. Being stuck in an elevator alone is terrifying enough. But then to hear all of this chaos happening around you and then feeling the building collapse is just horrifying. They also believe that in some of these elevators, fires broke out and the people that were in there were burnt alive. Or dying slowly from inhaling too much smoke. We all know how terrifying this day was, but to be trapped in those elevators, I don't know, it just doesn't sit right. 
On October 4, 2009, 42-year-old Kimberly Cates was hanging out at home with her daughter, Jamie. But by the end of the night, she would be dead. Early on the morning of October 4th, four young men approached Kimberly's home. They then shut off the power and entered the house. Upon entering the house, they searched the property for valuables before finding Kimberly in her bedroom with her 11-year-old daughter, Jamie. When the four intruders entered Kimberly's room, she woke up, and that's when they attacked her. These four young men had traveled to the home with a machete, and Kimberly was hacked to death with 36 blows to her head and torso. Obviously, this was an extremely gruesome scene. But after killing Kimberly and waking up her 11-year-old daughter, Jamie, the killers weren't done with their work yet. The killers then stabbed young 11-year-old Jamie in the face and in the chest. They were trying to stab her in the heart so she would die too. The killers then threw Jamie against a wall and exited the property after searching for valuables. At the end of the massacre, 42-year-old Kimberly Cates was dead, having been hacked to death with a machete in her own bed. Eventually, it was discovered that the two young men who planned out this massacre and recruited the other two boys for this violent spree were 17-year-old Stephen Spader and 19-year-old Christopher Gribble. Stephen Spader was a 17-year-old high school dropout who had formed a club centered around violence. This club was something that he called the Disciples of Destruction. Spader designed a logo for this club. He centered everything that it had to deal with around violence, and he began recruiting other members. That's when he found 19-year-old Christopher Gribble. Stephen then told the three other young men that he had recruited into this disturbing club that the rite of initiation that they had to pass was a brutal home invasion. So on that evening, they set out into the world looking for a random house to enter, and that's when they discovered Kimberly Cates' house, just somewhere along their route. Now, even though Kimberly died during the assault, her daughter Jamie survived miraculously. She ended up making a full recovery and is seemingly living a pretty normal life nowadays. Her father, Kimberly's husband, was traveling at the time of the attacks, and he wasn't there on that fateful day. Obviously, these two got life in prison, and their accomplices got a minimum of 30 years in prison. It's just disturbing to consider the fact that these guys set out that evening just looking for a random house to break into, searching for potential victims. I have seen so many comments saying that these two should be released following the release of Gypsy Rose Blanchard. The Menendez brothers are infamously known for brutally murdering their parents in their Beverly Hills home on August 20th, 1989, aged just 18 and 21. 911 had received a phone call from a seemingly terrified Eric to say that he and his brother had arrived home to find their parents dead. The police arrived at the home and found Jose and Kitty Menendez dead inside. They were almost unrecognisable as they'd been shot with a shotgun 14 times. Due to the brutality of the murders, the police first assumed that it was some kind of mob hit. Following the murders of their parents, Eric and Lyle went on an epic spending spree. Their parents had been very wealthy and they took full advantage of having access to their money. They went on lavish holidays, bought expensive clothes, Rolex watches, went out for fancy meals and they even bought a restaurant. Not the kind of behaviour that you'd expect from two grieving young men who just found their parents brutally murdered. These two had spent close to a million dollars by the time the truth came out. A couple of months after the murders, Eric confessed to his therapist that it was him and Lyle that had killed their parents. He had no idea that this conversation was being recorded. The therapist then told a woman that he was having an affair with, and when that relationship went sour, she went straight to the police. Eric and Lyle were arrested, and their motive shocked everyone. They said that their father, Jose, had sexually abused them for most of their lives, and on the night of the murders, they'd confronted him. He said that he would kill them if they told anyone. So they went outside, grabbed their shotguns, came back in and started firing at their parents. They gave graphic accounts of the abuse in court and said that this is why they had to kill them. 
Two of the boys' cousins actually supported them in court and said that Lyle and Eric had told them about the abuse when they were children. One of them had even gone to Kitty and confronted her about it, and she'd said that it was all lies. Both Eric and Lyle were convicted of first-degree murder and sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. The brothers spent their first 22 years incarcerated completely separately, but in 2018 they were reunited and apparently they both burst into tears and gave each other a hug at their first meeting. They both remain incarcerated at the Richard J. Donovan Correctional Facility in San Diego. They are now 55 and 52 and they are both married. I'm really interested to hear your opinions on this and whether you think they should be released or not. Killer accidentally admitted to his crimes by accident when he forgot he was wearing a microphone while taking part in a documentary. This is how a true crime documentary exposed a killer. In 1971, Robert Durst met Kathleen McCormack and they got married. At the time of her disappearance in 1982, Kathleen had nearly graduated college. She was last seen by a witness at a dinner party where she appeared to be upset. She got a call from Robert and left. Robert admitted to having argued with Kathleen that night, but he said he put her on a train to New York and then never saw her again. Her friend called police to report her missing. Interestingly, Kathleen had been treated at a medical centre for facial bruises weeks prior to this and told the friend that Robert had done it. Robert had actually been dating someone else for some time prior to this and had been living separately to Kathleen. When her family broke into her cottage to try and find out where she was, they found the place had been trashed and her possessions put in the bin. Kathleen's family always believed that Robert was involved in her disappearance. In 2000, Susan Berman, a friend of Robert's, was found murdered. Now, she'd actually provided Robert with an alibi for Kathleen's disappearance. Now, pay really close attention to this next bit. Days after she was killed, a letter addressed to the Beverly Hills Police Department contained Susan's address and the word cadaver on it. On the envelope, Beverly was misspelled. Robert admitted in 2005 that Susan had called him shortly before her death to say that the police wanted to question her about Kathleen going missing. It's believed that Robert killed Susan to keep her quiet. In 2001, Robert's neighbour's body parts were found floating in Galveston Bay. Robert's elderly neighbour, Morris Black, had been killed and Robert was arrested. He was actually released on bail and fled and was found about a month later in Pennsylvania. He was found with $37,000 cash, two weapons, and interestingly, Morris Black's driving license. In court, Robert claimed he was acting in self-defense. He said he'd accidentally shot Morris and dismembered his body. Due to lack of forensics, he only got five years in jail. This is where things get really crazy. HBO was filming a documentary called The Jinx. During production, Susan's stepson found a letter written by Robert. This contained the same spelling error in the word Beverly as the anonymous letter to police. This implicated Robert in the murder. Now, while filming the documentary, Robert needed the toilet. He forgot that he had a microphone still attached to him. He was recorded talking to himself. He said, there it is, you're caught. You're right, of course, but you can't imagine. Arrest him. And then he said, what a disaster. He was right, I was wrong. And finally, he said, I'm having difficulty with the question. What the hell did I do? Killed them all, of course. Did you know the opening to this horror film was based on a crazy true crime case? The opening scene of Jeepers Creepers features two people driving down the road with a van tailgating them. It's a scene that is reminiscent of a reenactment done on the Unsolved Mysteries program in 1991. The case in question involves Ray and Marie Thompson, siblings who were just driving down the road one day outside of Michigan. In their rearview mirror, they noticed a suspicious van. Now the van initially passed them and they did notice that he seemed to be in a hurry. Shortly after they passed the van again, but this time they noticed it was parked outside an abandoned schoolhouse. The driver appeared to be holding a blood soaked sheet. Although they did drive past, yet again they noticed the van shortly after in their rear view mirror. It was driving aggressively close to them for the next two miles, just like the opening scene in Jeepers Creepers. The siblings turned off the highway and discussed what they should do. They decided to turn the car back around and try and get a good view of the number plate to report to the police. However, when they approached the van again, they noticed that the mystery man was crouching down and changing the number plates. They were also shocked to see inside the open door of the van was covered in blood. They immediately called police who were actually already on the hunt for the male van driver and his wife. 
Dennis Depew was the man in question. In 1971, he had married Marilyn. They did have three children together, but Dennis was very controlling. Marilyn filed for divorce in 1989 and Dennis moved out. However, Dennis would regularly freak Marilyn out by letting himself into the house. One day she came home to find him sat on the sofa, even though she had changed all of the locks. On Easter Sunday, 1990, Dennis arrived at her house to collect two of the children. However, Dennis became angry at Marilyn during the visit and ended up pushing her down the stairs. With their children watching on in horror, Dennis beat Marilyn and dragged her out of the house. Their eldest daughter ran to a neighbor's house to try and ring police, but it was too late. Dennis drove off with Marilyn in the van, lying to his children that he was taking her to the hospital. Responding to the eyewitness reports, the forensic team taped off the schoolhouse crime scene. They discovered Marilyn's body the day after by the roadside. She had been shot in the head. Police were now on the hunt for Dennis as he drove across the country. On March the 20th, a woman returned to her house to see her boyfriend's van on the drive. She believed that her boyfriend's name was Hank. He told her that he needed to rush home as his mum was very unwell. Meanwhile, the TV in the house was playing an Unsolved Mysteries episode. The episode featured news of a man called Dennis who was wanted for murder. Hank, whose real name was Dennis, was desperately trying to distract his girlfriend from the episode. He was terrified that if she saw the TV, she would recognize him. At this point, Dennis drove off, but the police were on his tail. A 15 mile high speed car chase ensued. Officers rammed his van and forced him off the road, but seconds later, Dennis pulled the trigger and unalived himself. We need to talk about what's going on in Jackson, Mississippi right now and how 215 bodies were just found buried in a field behind a jail. I honestly don't know how this isn't national news by now. 215 bodies were just found buried in unmarked graves behind the Hines County Jail, or more specifically the Hines County Penal Farm in Jackson, Mississippi. Some of the grave sites were completely unmarked, while others were only identified by a number on a metal rod. The family members of these victims were never notified that their loved ones were buried, and the majority of them still just thought that they were missing. And the state in which this mass graveyard was found is absolutely horrendous. The bodies were placed in body bags and never embalmed before being buried in a shallow grave. And the stench was reportedly so bad that it attracted birds and other animals to try and scavenge for the remains. This discovery has made many question why authorities never investigated these deaths and why they also chose to never contact the victim's family members before burial. What's even more disgusting is the fact that now that this has gone public, authorities want the victim's family members to pay a fee to collect their loved ones' bodies. This discovery all started because of a mom who was searching for her missing son, Dexter Wade. This is Betterston Wade, and she last saw her son Dexter on March 5th, 2023, around 7.30 p.m. when he left her home. After not being able to contact him, Betterston officially reported Dexter missing to police on March 14th, although at first she was hesitant to do so because she didn't trust the Jackson Police Department. Just four years prior, Betterson's 62-year-old brother died after a Jackson police officer slammed him into the ground. That officer was convicted of manslaughter, but he's currently trying to appeal. Because of this, she was scared to report Dexter missing to that same police department, but she ultimately thought that's what was best to try and find him. The case, unfortunately, was not taken seriously from the very start, as the initial investigator assigned to the case misspelled Dexter's name as Dester. But Betterson gave the police department photos of him and remained in constant contact for updates. She reached out to the police department multiple times over the span of months, but every single time they told her that they had no updates for her, which was not true at all. In fact, they knew where Dexter was from the very beginning. Just 30 minutes after leaving his mom's home the night he went missing, Dexter was hit and killed by an off-duty Jackson police officer in a police SUV. At the time of the incident, the officer was not cited for any traffic violations, he wasn't given a field sobriety test, and Dexter's death was ruled accidental. Now, Jackson police say they were unable to identify him at his time of death, but according to the autopsy, the medical examiner, and from Dexter's body eventually being exhumed, it was found that his driver's license had been in his front pocket the entire time. At first, Jackson PD said they couldn't identify him, but then they changed their story to say that they called Dexter's mom once to inform her of his death, but when she didn't answer, they never tried calling again, even despite the medical examiner giving them that information from the start. 
Even though Dexter was hit by a Jackson police officer and was reported missing with that same department, whenever Betterston called for updates, they always told her that they were unable to find him. In reality, they'd sent him off to that mass gravesite to be buried in an unmarked grave. That same gravesite where 215 bodies were now just discovered. It wasn't until nearly eight months later that Jackson PD told Betterston where she could find her son. They took her down that long dirt road deep into the woods, past an empty horse stable and scrapyard behind the Hines County Penal Farm. As they walked further into the field, they passed rows of metal rods, each marked with a number, in which we now know were actually graves. They eventually stopped at grave number 672, where Dexter had been laying for months unclaimed due to the negligence of Jackson PD. Betterston then had to pay them $250 to claim his body and have him properly buried. Because of this discovery, two other men who were buried and forgotten in this graveyard have been identified. One is Jonathan David Hankins, who was reported missing in June of 2022. His family only learned of his death from news outlets on December 4th, not through law enforcement. Jonathan was burned and buried on this field. Another victim is Mario Moore. He was also burned and buried in an unmarked grave in this same field after he was found beaten to death and wrapped in tarp back in February. His family didn't learn about his burial until eight months after he was killed. Families of the victims are now calling for a federal investigation to uncover the truth about what is really happening in Jackson, Mississippi. This is And this is only the beginning of the crimes that this guy carried out. Some of the other stuff that we're going to touch on is absolutely disgusting. It's absolutely, it's just horrific. And the story of how Peter Scully was eventually identified and arrested is extremely captivating. I'm going to run out of time here on this video, but if you want to see a part two, let me know below. This story is far from over. John Wayne Gacy, the killer clown, did not act alone. This TikTok series is about to blow your mind, but there's a lot of information here, so proceed with caution. The case of John Wayne Gacy, the serial killer clown, is one of the most infamous true crime stories in American history. A brief overview of the case, in the 1970s, John Wayne Gacy murdered 33 young men. He buried them in the crawl space beneath his home and his yard, and he was connected to a number of different crimes. Gacy himself gained infamy because he dressed up as Pogo the Clown on the weekends and volunteered at hospitals and children's birthday parties. Now, the official story says that John Wayne Gacy acted completely alone. He had no help in carrying out any of these murders, but I really don't believe that that's the case. 
Through all of our research that we did for our podcast, we've determined that Gacy was connected to a number of other killers, pedophiles across America. And he even may have been connected to one of America's other most infamous serial killers, the Candyman out of Houston, Texas. So before we get into this, I want to state that I do believe that Gacy did murder some people, and I think he was very complicit in all of this, obviously, but I don't think that he acted alone. But why do I think that? So to start off, we need to talk about Jeffrey Rignall, this guy who was actually a survivor of John Wayne Gacy. After a night of abuse and essay at the hands of John Wayne Gacy, Jeffrey Rignall was allowed to go free. But what Jeffrey would go on to tell authorities and the media about what happened that night at Gacy's home is a major thing in this whole conspiracy. Now, Jeffrey would tell the police that while Gacy was essaying him, there was another man in the room. Now, whether or not this other man participated in the essaying or they were there to watch, it doesn't matter. Someone was watching this criminal act occur. He knew he could give a description of the guy, and he knew that someone else was there watching this happen. Then we get to Robert Bob Gilroy, who was a victim of John Wayne Gacy. So Robert Gilroy was abducted on September 15th, 1977. That's the official date that he went missing. He was supposed to show up for an event after that day, but he never showed. But John Wayne Gacy's plane tickets and records placed him as being out of the state at the time. His plane tickets from the time show that Gacy left Illinois on September 12th, and he didn't return until September 16th, the day after Robert Gilroy went missing. Already, these two facts point to a larger conspiracy at hand. There may have been people helping procure victims for Gacy, and he may have been even paying for these victims. And that's when we get to Philip Paskey and John David Norman, two of the most horrific people I've ever read about. And this is where the connections with the case start to get really shocking. And we've talked about John David Norman here on my TikTok before. This guy was connected with the higher ups in the government. This guy had lots of political power, and he was a known pedophile. Remember, in earlier TikToks, I even told you about how John David Norman was arrested multiple times. He had Rolodexes full of index cards of the people who he was supplying these young men to. And both times, the police departments lost the Rolodexes and lost all the names of the abusers. But how did they connect to Gacy? Well, in part two, we're going to talk about it. This guy is one of the most awful serial killers there has ever been, and I feel like he's never talked about. In my opinion, this guy's worse than Ted Bundy, Jeffrey Dahmer... Hi Meg, I talk about your crime. Let's get into the story of The Butcher, the worst serial killer Canada has ever seen. Robert Picton was born October 24th, 1949 in British Columbia, Canada. Robert had quite a bad upbringing. His dad was very abusive. He actually grew up on a pig farm. From a really young age, him and his brother had to work countless hours on this pig farm. And then they were forced to go straight to school without taking a shower or anything. Because he was showing up to school unwashed, Robert started getting bullied and they gave him the nickname Stinky Piggy. As Robert grew older, he was said to be very quiet, but he apparently sometimes had these weird bursts of bizarre behavior. These bursts would come out of nowhere and he would just start acting really strange. In 1996, Robert's brother opened up a kind of charity thing the charity was started to try to make more money for their pig farm. It was called the Piggy Palace Good Times Society. And what they would do is they would hold huge parties and raves to try and raise money. And I'm not joking when I say huge parties and raves. 17,000 people were said to have shown up at one point. 17,000 people at once. Sex workers and biker gangs would join these parties as well, but for Robert, it all started going downhill in 1997 when he attempted to murder a girl. I don't usually do this in these videos, but a lot of you ask what blush I use, and this is the blush I use. It's usually 10 pounds on the TikTok shop, but it's on for Fiverr right now. So if you click right here, you can get it. I just ordered kind of a peachy version of this. I'm not being paid to talk about this, I just saw they were on offer and you guys ask about these all the time, so get your hands on them for cheap while you can. So Robert attempts to murder a woman for the first time that we know of. According to her statement, he attempted to handcuff her and then he started stabbing her multiple times before she managed to get away. This should have been the thing that got him on police radar, but he was able to get the charges dropped because the woman he attacked was on a lot of drugs at the time, and Robert used that to come up with a story. He told police, like, she was hitchhiking, I was just trying to help her, and she attacked me. And they believed him, because she was on drugs. And unfortunately, for the next 60 women he would kill, he was let go. 
and he was able to come up with a strategy that wouldn't get him caught next time. He developed a plan and started killing a bunch of women. And Robert was really, really good at staying under the radar. Now, what did he do exactly? Let me tell you. Because it's just, it's disturbing. First of all, he always went for hitchhikers, addicts, or prostitutes. And what he would do is he would promise them money, drugs, accommodation, anything to get them back to his farm. Once he got them back, he would then shoot or strangle them to death. And this next part is why he was given the name the Butcher. He would take the victims' bodies, chop them up, and feed them to his pigs. Now, if you're not aware of this already, pigs will literally eat anything. Everything. So the evidence was just, bye. They were getting rid of the evidence for him. All of a sudden, there is an increase in missing women in the area. But sadly, because he only went after sex workers or addicts or hitchhikers, no one cared. And this always makes me so mad with cases like these. Like, they're still human beings, but no bodies were showing up, so there was no crime, no body, no crime. But as the numbers started rising, people were kind of getting a bit worried. A group of people that weren't the police actually got a list together of all of the names of these young women who were missing. They brought that to the police and were like, do you see now? And that's when the investigation actually began into finding out what happened to these girls. And all of these girls had one person in common, Robert Picton. He was the only person whose name continuously came up when they were looking for these girls. Police needed a way to get onto the farm with a warrant without him knowing about it and hiding all the evidence first. And so they heard that he had possession of an illegal firearm. And so they used that as the cover up to get onto his property. On the property, they found multiple items that belonged to these missing women along with some blood-stained clothing and tiny bone fragments. Now, things aren't looking too good for Robert, but because the pigs had eaten all the evidence, basically all of it, they were only able to charge him with the murder of six women. And so he got six counts of murder. When he got arrested, he actually said that he killed 49 women and that he was sad that he didn't get to round up to 50. What the hell, Robert? What does he want the police officer to say like, oh, I feel so bad for you. No. He was arrested in 2002 and this trial was huge. Of course, he was sentenced to life in prison with no possibility of parole. But guys, that's not the worst part of this story because I'm getting to that now. One element of the story that I kept out until now is that Robert, <laughs> Robert sold the meat of his pigs to people who lived around the area. These pigs who ate the remains of 60 women were sold to his neighbors. When I say neighbors, I just mean people who live in the area. So like secondhand, cam can secondhand cannibalism. I could never eat pig again if that was me. So yeah, they were pretty um, disturbed and freaked out by this information, which is uh, totally understandable and just totally disgusting. After a huge search of his property, police now believe that the number of women Robert killed was in the 60s. 60 women. 60 mother, daughters, wives. It's insane. It really annoys me with cases like these. I know it was like in 2002 and things have changed, but have they? I find that a lot of cases like these that I cover always start with, oh, all these women were going missing, but they were sex workers, but they were drug addicts, who cares? And it's like, it's insane to me that like they're not seen as equals to any other woman walking on the street, but whatever, hopefully that changes. And for those wondering, I have actually covered this story before, but the quality of the video was so, so bad that I just, I couldn't keep it up anymore. Like, it really bothered me to watch back, so I thought I would remake it in a higher quality way. I hope you guys enjoyed it regardless, and have a wonderful day.
My heart goes out to every single one of the victims, their families, and people who cared about them. Um, and I hope Robert rots in jail. Anyways, this is not a good representation of Canadians. We're actually really nice people. I'll see you all in the next video. Love you guys. Bye. This little girl got revenge on her killer from beyond the grave. On the 25th of January 2005, Katie Coleman finished school and went back to her home in Indiana, United States. Katie was 10 years old and lived with her mum and dad and sister. At 3pm that day, her mum asked her to go to the dollar store to get toilet roll. Now Katie knew the area well and it wasn't really far to go. After getting the toilet roll from the shop, Katie stopped at the bank to get a lollipop for her way home. However, when Katie's dad returned home, the little girl still wasn't back. Her parents called police and a few days later an amber alert was issued. A witness came forward to say that they'd seen a girl who looked like Katie in a truck. The driver was described as a skinny white man about six feet tall with short dark hair and fair complexion. Tragically, five days after going missing, Katie's body was found. It was in a creek just a few miles from her home. Disturbingly, her hands and feet were tied and she had been essayed. It was determined that her cause of death had been drowning. 20-year-old Charles Hickman rang the police to confess. He said he and another man had abducted Katie after she'd witnessed a substance deal. He said they tried to scare her into not saying anything and they tied her up, but she ended up falling in and drowning. Disgustingly, this turned out to be a false confession. This obviously wasted police time and caused massive amounts of distress to Katie's family. Police continued to look for evidence and they did find a cigarette butt near to Katie's body. They tested it for DNA and it matched a man called Anthony Stockelman. Police compared the DNA on the cigarette butt to the DNA on Katie's body and it was a match. Anthony, a father of two young boys, was in the area that day visiting his mother. He entered a guilty plea and was given life in prison without parole. But this is not the only punishment that Anthony would receive. Now, Anthony claims that he was under the influence of extreme mental or emotional disturbance during the crime. He said this is because his father had died six months prior. Regardless, Anthony was imprisoned. Unlucky for Anthony, he was actually housed in a prison with Katie's cousin. Jared Harris was serving a sentence for burglary and was in the same wing as Anthony. Jared forcibly tattooed the words Katie's revenge across Anthony's forehead. He wanted to brand Anthony for life for killing his young cousin. This is Jared Fogle, one of the worst pedophiles in American history. So if you don't know who Jared Fogle was, he was the spokesperson for Subway for a number of years. Jared initially became famous and then eventually became the spokesman of Subway because he dropped so much weight while eating a Subway diet. According to Jared, he lost almost 245 pounds while eating almost exclusively from Subway. Obviously, this was a huge story and when Subway heard about this, they contacted Jared and eventually made him the spokesman for their entire company. I swear to God, I remember this. For years, you couldn't turn on the TV without seeing this guy's face. So in 2004, when Jared was at the height of his popularity, he launched the Jared Foundation, a foundation determined to fight childhood obesity. This foundation saw Jared touring schools across the nation, talking to kids about losing weight, and yeah, just being heavily involved with children, which people at the time thought was a great thing. But it was when he was away from the cameras, behind the scenes, when Jared was engaging in some of the most deplorable behavior I've ever read about. So in 2007, a radio host and journalist from Florida came forward to the FBI and reported that Jared was saying and doing some concerning things. Apparently, while at a middle school event, Jared had been talking to her about performing lewd acts on a minor. He had texted her about all of these things, and she even recorded him saying all this stuff. At one point, apparently, Jared even asked this journalist if she could install webcams in her children's bedroom so he could watch them. Obviously, this was concerning. This journalist recorded all of this, turned it into the FBI, but they told her that they couldn't do anything because they didn't have enough evidence. And now we got to talk about Russell Taylor, a guy who was heavily involved in Jared's foundation. So when he wasn't working on the Children's Foundation, this guy, Russell Taylor, was producing CP in his home. Apparently, between the years 2011 and 2015, Russell Taylor had videotaped minors in his own home and traded photographs of them with none other than, you guessed it, Jared Vogel, King of the Footlong. According to court documents, Jared actually asked Russell if he could move some of the nanny cams in his home so he could watch children in varying states of undress or while they were naked taking a bath. Russell also claimed that Jared made him set up accounts on porn sites in his name and he wanted to basically run his whole CP operation for him. Well, shortly after Russell Taylor was arrested, Jared Fogel's home was raided and guess what they found? A ton of CP. On the same day that his home was raided, Subway severed all ties with Jared and some new disturbing facts came to light during the trial. Apparently years prior, Jared had been texting a Subway franchisee named Cindy. 
And over these texts, he talked about wanting to abuse kids aged 9 to 16. He told Cindy she should sell herself for sex on Craigslist, and even asked her to arrange a sexual meetup between him and her 16-year-old cousin. Eventually, Jared pled guilty to possession of CP and traveling to conduct an illicit sexual behavior with a minor. Apparently, while in New York City, he paid to have sex with a 17-year-old girl. But this story isn't over yet. I'm going to post part two, and it definitely gets more interesting from here on out. The family of this missing girl found out via the media that she'd been murdered, butchered, and sold as kebab meat. This case will put you off ever eating a kebab again. Charlene Downs disappeared aged just 14 years old in November 2003. She was living in Blackpool, UK and was last seen in an area containing many kebab shops and takeaways. While out with her friends one night, Charlene bumped into her mum. Her mum said that Charlene needed to be home by 10pm that night, which was quite typical for Charlene. Tragically, this would be the last time that her mum would ever see Charlene alive. When Charlene didn't turn up by 10pm, her dad went out on his bike looking for her for around half an hour. When he couldn't find her, he just presumed that she'd stayed over at her friend's house and went home and went to sleep. When she still didn't arrive the next morning, her parents started to get worried and they called police. Police, however, said that they could not report this as a missing person until she'd been missing for 48 hours. Eventually, police did start to look for her, but they said that they presumed she was a runaway. The case went cold until three years later. Charlene's family were called into a police station. There was news of two men who had been arrested linked with a local takeaway called Funny Boys. They were arrested on suspicion of murder and disposal of Charlene. This is when the family found out some shocking news via the media about what had happened to Charlene. An article published stated that she had been grinded up and sold as kebab meat. One of the brothers of the men who had been arrested had heard them bragging about doing this. Now, Charlene's disappearance actually unearthed the fact that these takeaways were being used as a front for pee rings, where men were luring teenagers in with food and alcohol in exchange for things I cannot repeat on this app. When the case against these two men went to trial, the jury failed to reach a verdict. The case was then thrown out of court due to apparent lack of physical evidence. One of the reasons for this is how well Charlene's body had obviously been disposed of. Both men who had been charged were given a quarter of a million pounds compensation for being falsely trialed. Around a week after the trial, Charlene's mum was actually arrested for stabbing her husband. He declined to press charges saying that he knew she had been stressed. Members of the family were also charged with racially aggravated assault against the brother of the man who'd been charged with murder and also punching the man who'd been charged with helping dispose of her body. In August 2017, police arrested a 51-year-old man who lived in Blackpool at the time of Charlene's disappearance. This was on suspicion of murdering her. However, he was released just two days later. We still have no justice for Charlene and nobody is behind bars for her killing.